we have been uh, looking at the assembly and the things that the assembly does in our Sunday evening lessons, and we're looking at the worship that the assembly does. We, uh, in the last time that we came together, we looked at the teaching of the apostles that is being done, the doctrine of the apostles, but uh, we'll look at some of the other things here this evening. I want, first of all, to take us back to where we started in Acts 2, because this is where it came from. We decided, hey, and by we, I mean me and the frog in my pocket, decided that we were going to um, start over, if you will, let the Bible dictate what is it that we are doing and why are we doing that, uh, which I think is a very reasonable and a good thing to be done, rather than looking at what has been done or considering traditions of brethren or otherwise, we ought rather to be able to let the Bible dictate and find that that's what we're doing. Or if it isn't, then we ought to. Ought to make that so. So, Acts 2, 41, 42, when they first obeyed the gospel, when they first were Christians, uh, it says they who received that word were baptized, and there were added about 3,000 souls that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. This is telling us that there are four things, and, and we pointed out, uh, I guess, last time, uh, that all of these things are labeled as the, <laughs> the teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, the prayers. And uh, that's telling us that they are the four things that the congregation did when it started. That is how the church conducts itself. This is what they're devoted to. And uh, we looked, as I say last time, at the apostles' teaching, that is, the doctrine. There is, And there is a real doctrine, there's a teaching, which is like the law of Moses, sometimes is called the teaching. Um, it is a, a, a defined body of knowledge, and that is the thing that the uh, apostles have espoused and brought forward the same way that Moses uh, recorded for us in his books. And, uh, well, I was thinking to go right into the fellowship at this juncture. Let me move this around. And I think that's fine. Um, so we'll get started on that. Now, what's interesting, I guess, and should be noted about the fellowship <laughs> is that this actually, this word has a broader meaning that encompasses more than one thing that we do. So I did want to look at it in this way, and there really are two meanings of this, uh, or it's used in two different ways, I should say. Um, the word is a word that means something held in common, something that we, uh, you know, that, that is a commonality, something that uh, we are, you know, shareholders in, stakeholders in, if you will, partners together in whatever that is there's something there that is common that is held between uh, us that's what a fellowship is so if it's uh, you know if it's a soccer league the fellowship is soccer right you show up to the soccer league with football um uh, shoulder pads and a helmet, you will be in the wrong place, right? Because that is not the basis of their fellowship. Their fellowship is a soccer fellowship, right? So the the thing that is held in common, that is the the purpose, right? So, all right, moving on here. First, we're talking about a spiritual commonality or a spiritual share 
a spiritual union or fellowship, and that spiritual fellowship is had with God, and it's had with the people of God. So that's the first one. The second idea is a literal share uh, among Christians when we uh, share in other things. But first, let's look at the spiritual union. There's 1 John 1, 3, where he says, what we've seen and heard we proclaim to you so that you also may have fellowship with us. That is, you will now have this in common with us. And our fellowship truly is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. It's telling us that first we have things in common with God, meaning we hear from God, we accept the teaching from God. That is That puts us in common with him. And then what happens is, you find that when we are aligned with God, if you will, vertically, we come into alignment, I guess horizontally, with everybody else who is also aligned with God. That's what you're seeing here. We have something in common with God. They have something in common with God. That thing that they have in common is the same thing that we have in common. And that's how we are sharers or partakers together. So. That's why he's saying what he is. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you, and you then have a share with us. This is another passage, actually, that is useful whenever you're thinking about whether the Bible is complete, whether the Bible, the Bible has all the truth that we need. This is one of those passages. They said, what we have seen and heard, we are proclaiming to you, and you now have that in common with us. As in, there's not more to it than what is being proclaimed here. There's not more. We now have what they had. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9 also uses this word that is usually translated fellowship. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So we have something in common with the son, the fellowship of his son. There is the fellowship again, which is like what we read in Acts 2. They're dedicated to some specific thing, the fellowship of the Son. And then in chapter 10, verse 16, our word, the same word that is usually translated fellowship, is here being translated participation. The cup of blessing we bless, isn't it? A fellowship in the blood of Christ, or a commonly held thing, a commonality, a share. The bread we break, isn't it a fellowship in the body of Christ? This is why the Catholics call it communion. This communion is the same word as the thing held in common. And that is what it says, in truth. <laughs> uh, for what it's worth. Not because the Catholics said so, but because no, that, that is actually what's there in the Greek. It is the common share, the commonality that is held. The participation in the blood of Christ is that cup of blessing. The participation in the body of Christ is that bread that we break. This is a spiritual union, you see. A share together in something spiritual. Because those things are not a common meal. Those things are symbolic. There is also 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? Do light and dark, darkness have anything in common? No, they don't. <laughs> they are the opposites, right? So they have no commonality between them. There is nothing common there, and we also should not have anything in common. When we are children of light, we ought not walk in darkness, or have any share with darkness. This, that's more of that idea of the fellowship as a spiritual union. If we say we have fellowship with him, 1 John 1, 6 through 7, while we walk in darkness, we're lying and not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light, in the same way that he is in the light, well, we have fellowship with one another, we and he, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. So we have 
this commonality only if we walk in the light the way that he walks in the light. And as we read in 2 Corinthians, uh, you know, there is no commonality, there's no share between light and darkness. It makes perfect sense. So when the church was dedicated to the fellowship, um, in part, they are dedicated to this spiritual union. Jude 3, beloved, though I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, which means the, the salvation we share, the held in common, the fellowship, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And that's a pretty crushing blow when you think about it. He said, I wanted to write about what we held in common, but I had to write appealing to you to contend for the faith, which means that we don't have that in common. Their fellowship is broken. They, they have not maintained that common share. They're not about the same thing. Okay, so when the church came together, um, it, it does have a, a clear, I guess, a clearly defined nucleus there that we have to be right with God. We have to be right with his son. And then we are in fellowship with one another, but it really is based on being in the light as he is in the light. It's based on us being right with God, that what he wants is what we want. That's why we assemble in his name to honor him. Now, the other thing about this word fellowship is that it includes singing. <laughs> so once you get to the idea that this is a common thing, a thing that's, that's held by all or that all participate in or share in, then you can understand how it includes some of the other things that we think of as separate acts of worship. But really, they fall under the heading of the fellowship. In Ephesians 5, 18 to 21, don't get drunk with wine, that is debauchery. Rather, be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the heart, or I'm sorry, making melody to the Lord with the heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And this idea that we submit to one another because of our reverence for the Lord is our, we are sharing when we are singing. When we are um, uh, addressing one another in psalm, that is a share. Uh, the psalms, the hymns, the spiritual songs are things that are held in common. As is the thanksgiving that is in the heart. So our singing in worship falls under the header of Acts 2, the fellowship. And it's true, that's you know one of the chief reasons, if you will, that we sing together. There are not soloists, there's not a choir, because it is a thing that we, we do together. It's something we hold in common. And Colossians 3, same thing, right? 14 to 17, above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell within you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So there is a commonality about all of that, you see. We have the songs in common. The psalms, of course, are from the word of God itself, one of the things that is delivered to us, the way that the apostles delivered their word, their testimony to us. Right? And we... And we uh, admonish one another, we teach one another with the things that are said, we're in subjection to one another, we are doing the things that make for harmony and love in the local assembly as part of the singing. And this is the commonality that makes it a fellowship. That is fellowship, uh, or 
Yeah, a share, a partaking, participation. There is also, under the header of fellowship, a literal share, not just a spiritual or symbolic share, but a literal share among Christians. For example, in Hebrews 13, 6, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And that share, yes, is our word for fellowship, or commonality, as in you turn your property into common property. <laughs> Sorry, I chuckle because I remember when one time Sam ate the last of the ice cream and uh, when he was redressed for his faults, his response was, it was in the public fridge. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> well, that's the concept of share what you have. You're putting it out there in the public in some sense to be common. Also, in Acts 2, you find that soon after uh, the church was established on the Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You find that people who had come to Jerusalem traveling for religious festival from foreign countries had decided they weren't going to go home. Actually, they were going to stay there in Jerusalem and be part of what the church is doing and sold off their things and you have this situation arising in Acts 2, 44, for example. All who believed were together and had all things in common, that is, in fellowship. And the same thing happens in Acts 4, 32. The full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. No one said that any of the things belonging to him was his own, but they held everything in common, which is fellowship. It's the same fellowship or commonality that we've been talking about the whole time. Uh, it's the same one that was there in, in uh, Hebrews saying, sh be sure to share and to do good. That's the same word. And it's what the, the saints did in that place. In a very literal way, they did this. Which is to say, when people were relocating and settling in Jerusalem and did not have what they needed, perhaps because their things back home had not sold, or the money had not yet arrived from the sale of their things, or they maybe didn't have that much to sell in the first place, whatever, the church helped one another in this way. Now, uh, over in Romans 15, it is also the word, and this perhaps also surprising, that is usually translated contribution. It's actually the word fellowship. Uh, Romans 15, 26, Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some fellowship for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. When the churches decided, each to, according to their ability, to give money for the relief of saints in Judea during a time of famine. Their doing so was called a fellowship. Uh, we usually give it, you know, like say, we it's usually translated con contribution. Uh, because when you're making a contribution to something, you know, that's your share, that's your part that you're throwing into the pot. Um, but it's actually the same word, fellowship. They're sharing what they have with the saints in need in Judea who do not have. So that happens in 2 Corinthians 8, which I'd like to look at with you for a bit here, 1 through 4. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that's been given among the churches of Macedonia in a severe test of affliction. Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the fellowship of the saints. That is to say, the relief, the contribution, 
whatever, however you want to call it, the thing that the churches were doing, sending money to the elders of the church in Judea. That here is translated relief. Others might say contribution. It's our word fellowship. They're literally sharing what is theirs with the saints in another place. In 2 Corinthians 9.13, he writes to this church, Corinth, that the Judeans will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and because of the generosity of your fellowship for them and for all others. Your contribution. The church there sent money to Judea to relieve those saints at the time of the famine, right? And he said, look, the, the church in Judea will glorify God because they have submitted the church, because the Corinthians, the Greeks, have submitted to the gospel of Christ, and they will also glorify God because of the generosity of contribution. So that also is a fellowship, it's a share. They hold this in common. The church there is sending money to Judea. That is a fellowship. And in Philippians 1, 3, uh, down through 5, he said, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. That is fellowship. You and I are partners working together in the gospel, but this is a share. They hold, they share something in common. Now, it's true that we all Christians have a spiritual union, a spiritual fellowship, and that is, of course, one of the things. But you find out later in the letter that Paul is talking pretty precisely about the literal sharing, which is the support that Philippi sent him. They sent money to Paul to preach the gospel. He says in Philippians 4, 15 to 16, you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So the church entered into partnership, that's fellowship, commonality with him by means of giving and receiving. So they sent money to support Paul preaching as he traveled through Greece. Even in Thessalonica, which is to say next door to where they were in Macedonia. And it's very interesting what um, you know, Philippi gave while he was traveling, he said, no church entered into partnership. There wasn't fellowship. That's an interesting thing to think about, that sending support, sending money to support someone who is teaching the gospel is a partnership. And, you know, nobody else entered into that partnership with him. These other churches had that spiritual union, but they did not have that literal share which would have been a good thing to do. But they were not strong enough and they were not mature enough to do so, as you can tell in, in Acts 20 uh, and other places. He's undercutting the false teachers in Greece by not accepting money from them. But we just read, didn't we, in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, how that the Macedonians had gone over and above beyond their means out of their poverty. You know, you have a tendency to look at this and see, you know, Philippi is giving money to, to Paul and Philippi is contributing and you're thinking to yourself, well, they must be the wealthy, but they are not. They are the poor and they're giving according to their means and well beyond their means, Paul said, as I can testify. So he knows that he is receiving support from them. He knows that they are sending money to Judea. And he knows their situation, having been there personally, that they are poor, not rich. But they're still giving because they're holding that fellowship, that partnership, that commonality. It's a real, you know, tangible share 
but we're, we're working together side by side, including sharing resources. So regarding the contribution itself, you know, this is something we are told to do when assembled on the first day of the week. Concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 begins, so you also must do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. Again, this is the first day of the week in every, uh, I guess, family or every wage earner is responsible for storing up, setting aside. And this is the building of the treasury in the local place. Um, but it is that share that we have in the work of God. So, yes, what you give matters. And, you know, um, it shows to you, if not to anybody else anyway, what it means to you and, and what part you have in it and how much uh, you know you support and participate in it, how much of your own labor um, that is earning money is being turned into uh, the money that is used for the Lord. That is a fellowship, it's a commonality, a share. As for the treasury itself, it's Acts 4, 34 to 37, where that was established. There was not a needy person among them. As many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is not a prescription for communism. It's saying those who had come from out of the country were selling off their land or their houses and back in their foreign countries because they're relocating to Jerusalem. And they're giving here knowing that there's a distribution to meet the need of everybody meeting, including themselves. In this way, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, native of Cyprus, sold the field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So again, he's a native of Cyprus. This is an island in the Mediterranean, far away from Jerusalem. That's the situation. The people who have traveled are leaving off their stuff and coming to Jerusalem. But, in Acts 5, a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his, knife, his wife's full knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds, and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Well, it's not a sin for him to sell a property and to keep a portion of the property. It's a sin for him to sell the property, keep a portion of it, and put down the rest saying that's all. <laughs> that's a lie. He's letting out that he's giving the full price of the land when he's not. It's not that he couldn't have given something less than 100%. It's just that he told them it was 100% when it was really not. Maybe 50, maybe 80, I don't know. Whatever it was, it wasn't worth it. Because he fell dead. And at, a, at an interval, about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, oh yeah, that was the price. But she also fell dead at, at his feet. But again, the point is, they sold it off, they gave. Once they gave, it became the Lord's. It was part of the treasury. And that made it something that was held in common. Which is a thing that is a very interesting, but an important thing to understand, as the fellowship of the saints... Um, you know, we, we are to be working in supporting the gospel, but we are also to be doing charity for children of God who have need. And that is part of the fellowship to which we are devoted. Regarding the contribution, 
There's also this account in Mark 12 that I wanted to get through. I think this is important. In Mark 12 is where Jesus watches them contribute, and I think it's worth looking at this to get at the attitude of the fellowship here. 38 to 44, in this teaching, Jesus said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, who like greetings in the marketplaces, and who have the best seats in the synagogues, the places of honor at feasts, who also happen to devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. That's unfortunate. Right? They will receive the greater condemnation. When you say, how do you devour widows' houses? Um, taxes. <laughs> taxes and fees. There's a widow, right? She, she doesn't have income. She doesn't have somebody in the household who's bringing in income, but her cost of living keeps going up. That's how you devour widows' houses. And the people who are doing that have the places of honor at feasts, right? The greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats. That's how it works. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which makes a penny. He called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. They all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. It tells us that the Lord is not so much looking for some dollar amount, he's looking for a percentage. <laughs> it's, it's not how much you put in the plate, it's how much that means to you. How much of your effort is going to the work of God. And that does matter. That's what he's judging on. Now I wanted to look at that contribution. Um, in this place, uh, there, uh, there's a, a contribution box, an offering box. And somehow Jesus has um, the ability to sit down and observe as people go by and, and give uh, you know, in our uh, way of doing things today, we're passing around a plate, um, and you can be turning to Nehemiah, but we're passing around a plate, but we could just as well have a box where people drop their contribution on their way in or their way out or whatever makes sense. Uh, I remember in the Catholic Church they had those, but they were <laughs> they were anchored to the floor and... As a kid, I used to like to reach into them because there was this serrated, sharp edge on the inside of the lip so that you didn't reach in there to try to take money out of it. <laughs> I always found that fascinating. I never got cut. It was just interesting to play with. <laughs> um, and you got to wonder what that says, that <laughs> your offering box has to be bolted to the floor and guarded with a sharp edge. That's another matter for another time. Uh, there's no prescription in the scriptures for how it has to be done. It could be a box like that. It would be fine. It could be the plates like we do. That is fine. I'm told that in the frontier days when it was hot and people were falling asleep, they would use those contribution boxes to hit people and nudge them awake. <laughs> That's kind of fun. Nehemiah 10 captures for us the contribution box. The people said, We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of the ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree, etc., year by year, to the house of the Lord, um, and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine, the oil, to the priests and the chambers of the house of our God, to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our towns where we labor. Well, the concept in the Old Testament of a place where they stored up the stuff that people brought is the word that in the gospel that we were just reading is translated as offering box. It's where they put the stuff that's being given. 
In 1244 of Nehemiah, men were appointed over the storerooms, the contributions, the first fruits, the tithes, to gather them into the portions required by the law for the priests and for the Levites, according to the fields of the towns. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered. And I think that is the way to end this, because we realize that our contribution, our sharing, um, is something that we are to do, as the Lord says, he loves a cheerful giver. Something that we do knowing that it's being used for God's work to help God's children. And that we give gladly and we rejoice. Uh, these were rejoicing over the priests and the Levites who ministered. They didn't consider their 10% a burden, uh, something that they groaned about or sniffed at or held um, uh begrudged, I guess, the, the Judahites, or the Levites, rather, the priests, they rejoiced about it, that they were able to support men who were helping them with spiritual matters, things of genuine spiritual need. That's worthy of support. So you think about what is worthy of support, what should be held up, what should have its needs met. Um, and there are things in life that are worthy of support. We, you know, we pay taxes, and much of what we pay taxes for is good. Our national parks are good, our roads, utilities, things of this nature, these are all good things. How much more the work of the Lord God? Shouldn't it be supported? So I think it's a great thing to see that they gave, and uh, the way that they gave, and it was stored up like that, forms the offering box of the New Testament, you know, which leads to the contribution, the treasury at the apostles' feet in Acts 4. So that we can see, yeah, it's a thing. We hand this to God, it becomes God's, it gets used for God's purposes, and we're glad for that. We give what we give gladly. That's a fellowship. A commonality and yeah of course there's a spiritual aspect to that as well as the literal share but the literal share counts too because your Heavenly Father knows that you need these things all right thank you for your attention we'll keep going at the next opportunity with some of the other acts of worship but suffice it to say it is an interesting thing I think what is considered fellowship and the fellowship to which they were dedicated, and how we worship God in our singing, we worship God in our giving, we worship God um, by sharing these things, holding them in common, partnering together. And the, these are the things that the church did then, and that's what the church does now. Today, if you are not a Christian, it's a good day. It is today the day of salvation. Today is the day to obey the gospel of Jesus before it is too late. Do not lose your soul. It's not worth it. Ananias and Sapphira fell dead after lying to the Holy Spirit about how much they were giving. It wasn't worth it. Whatever percentage they kept back, it wasn't worth it, was it? They lost their souls. If today you are not a Christian, become a Christian, a child of God. Put Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of sins, that you might be resurrected together with him. Today, if you are already a Christian and have not lived right, let us help you with our prayers on your behalf. If you need our prayers or need to be baptized, let that be known now by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected.